While going around the villages of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? John the Baptist, Elijah, a prophet. Jesus turns and says to them, who do you think I am? And Peter answers to him, you are the Messiah. Now when Peter answers that he's the Messiah, he's saying that he is the one written about in the Old Testament. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one to bring justice in an unjust society. He is pointing to the king that sits and reigns. Jesus accepts that title, but then everything changes from what the disciples thought. Good morning, my name is Tim Brand. I am the executive leader, founder of a Christian ministry called Many Hands for Haiti, and I have the privilege and the stewardship responsibility of walking with so many people that are following after God, seeking God's heart, and, and really walking together as we transform together in this broken world. And so that's our mission, is to transform together in a broken world. And that's three parts. Number one is there's transform. We're going to talk about that a lot today. That all are called to transform when they follow Jesus. All. Number two is that it's together, that as we walk together, it's not about what we're doing in Haiti to the Haitians, it's not that, it's that we are all called into transformation, and that as we seek our King Jesus, we draw closer together, because we're walking the same direction, and ultimately that we live in a broken world, and that there is brokenness around us, there's brokenness in Haiti, there's brokenness here, our brokenness just looks different, but God calls us to walk together in that for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. So that's what we're about, and that's what we're here to steward. Now today, I'm going to be talking on Mark. And what we've been really focusing on leading up to this point is the heart of God, which God is Jesus. Jesus is God incarnate, and he has come to show and demonstrate the heart of the Father. But at this particular time, at this intersection of the story, it pivots, it turns. Now, I am a former basketball player. Believe it or not, as tall as I am, I did play basketball. And one of the things you have to master as a basketball player is the art of the pivot. So in a pivot, you, you run and then you, know, you jump and then you move with one foot planted to a certain direction. And the pivot allows you to score a basket by keeping the defender on your backside. It allows you to turn to pass to an open player. It allows you to do things that advance the game of basketball so hopefully you're successful. And Jesus, at this point, pivots. He turns directly towards the cross, which is something that none of them imagined. None of them thought that the Messiah was going to a cross. And from here on out, from Mark 8 to the end of the book, it's all about, I am heading for the cross. So let's dig into this a little bit. Open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. You can put that up on the screen, please. Your few Bibles in this one in the back, it was 999, I don't know what that one was. I guess I grabbed the wrong Bible. But 999 is the one we're going to look at. It's at the bottom of the page. So Mark chapter 8, 31 and 32. Now this is Jesus talking after he told them about that he was, he was uh, the Messiah. He then began to teach them that the Son of God, the Son of Man, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside, and he began to rebuke him. Now understand that we all suffer from the curse of knowledge. So what that means is we know how this story ends. We know that Jesus goes to the cross, we know that he suffers, we know that he rises again, that he comes, spends 40 days, he goes back into heaven, and thus the Bible progresses and we all sit here today. We all know that story. But at this point and at this message, the disciples have no idea what the end game looks like. Okay? They have been following their king, they've been following, now's the first time publicly that anyone's ever said, this is the Messiah, 
They've been following him. They've seen him heal. They've seen him teach. They've seen him feed. They've seen him do all these. They've shown the heart of God, but they've never understood what he really was here to come for. And so this is the first time that they really discover what it is that Christ came to came here. And here's the thing, is that within this story, it flips so fast on them that Peter is furious. I mean, that word rebuke, that's the same word that Jesus used to take demons, grab them by the neck, and throw them into hell. This is not some, oh, Jesus, that might be wrong. That is, Jesus, you are wrong. Get behind me. That is, that is straight from hell. Okay, that is the level of rebuke that Peter has. And why is that? Why is this? And I'll, I'll explain this later about Peter, Peter later, why he gets so mad. But Jesus goes on to say, I must suffer. This isn't, well, I'm, maybe we'll suffer. It's, I must suffer. Must is the key phrase here. Must is the phrase that you've got to see, and it's repeated twice. Must, I must, I must. Why must the Savior die? I mean, I don't know if we've ever thought about that. I don't know if I've ever thought about it. It's like, why must he die? Hit the next slide, please. Now, as Christians, it is not a blind faith. It's one thing about following Jesus that he always does is he always gives information. He always demonstrates. He always shows. When the disciples were called when they were working on the Sea of Galilee, they didn't just pick up, I mean, it says in Matthew they picked it up, but if you read the other verses, they actually listened to Jesus. He invited them fishing. They caught a multitude of fish. Then they followed Jesus. Okay, so Christianity is always a faith that you get instruction that you see, and that upon that instruction, there's a truth that's revealed, and that truth is the foundation we can build upon. Jesus requires faith, but that faith is built upon truth. So what's the truth behind why the Savior of the world must suffer, must die? Three reasons. Hit the next slide. There's a personal necessity that Jesus has to fulfill for us. Now, I am a father of two. I've got an eight-year-old and a six-year-old. And as much as I would love to say that I can demonstrate unconditional love to my children... There are days that I fall short of that, particularly yesterday, before I'm going to preach, because my daughter's an eight-year-old who has her dad's stubbornness, which that's always kind of funny for parents. You know, they get the, the worst things, the things that make you you, they get, and then you see it in yourself, and you're like, why, why, God? It's a, it's a big cosmic joke that God has on us. But with that is, as humans, we all crave to be loved unconditionally. The problem is, is no matter how much we try, no matter how much we strive, no matter how much we want to do it, we fall short of unconditional love because we're human and because we're broken. But who is the one person that can show unconditional love? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Remember that dance that... that um, Tom talked about in the first one, where there's perfect unity amongst the three. They love each other perfectly. God doesn't need us to show how perfect love works. He already had that. But yet he came down to earth to demonstrate what perfect love looks like. Because we need perfect love. And anyone that's ever seen perfect love demonstrated, because there are times when we have unconditional love. Don't get me wrong. There are times in my life where I have loved unconditionally. There's times when I'm not. But for anyone that has stepped into that, Jesus gives the freedom to love unconditionally because we see how he loves. Thus, in turn, it fills us up, and then we are allowed to go and love more unconditionally. There was a personal necessity. Number two, there's a legal necessity. All right? So, for example, let's say you're at a party, and that you're dancing because you're all wild and crazy Christians, and you're dancing, and you knock over a, a light. The light gets broken, $100 light. So the question is, is who's going to pay for that broken light? Either you pay or the owner pays, but someone's going to have to pay. Flipply, that can can also work not just on economics, but emotionally. There are times when you've been hurt. Someone's done something against you, where you've loved and someone hasn't loved in return, and there is a hurt that happens 
There's a pain, there is something that is broken that needs fixed, okay? Somebody is going to have to pay for that. So what, what's the two solutions? Number one is I can try to tear down the other person's reputation. I can try to make sure that they know they're at fault. I can make sure they know that they have to pay for it. I know that they, 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 and through that, usually evil starts to reside in us. Our heart gets hard. We start to love less. We start to be bitter. We stop doing things that we used to love because we're afraid maybe we'll see that person. Or conversely, on the other side of it is you choose forgiveness. But here's the thing about forgiveness is it's hard. Who's ever forgiven someone and it's easy? It's not easy. Forgiveness is so hard because ultimately you are absorbing the debt that they should have paid. But here's the thing about forgiveness. Relationships can only be restored through forgiveness. Relationships aren't restored any other way. And Jesus, the Messiah, the blameless king, says, I have come so you can be forgiven. I have come to absorb, because with forgiveness, there's always suffering. That's why he must suffer. Number three is there's a cosmic necessity. Okay? So now, who can tell me who actually killed Jesus? Was it a lynch mob? Was it a out-of-control, bad, crazy, people who were obviously breaking the law all the time? <laughs> No, it was actually the teachers, the Pharisees, the Romans, the people who should have been protecting the world, the people who should have been the one that welcomes us, the one that's supposed to be looking out for justice. They are the ones that actually killed Jesus. And by them condemning Jesus, The world, Jesus actually condemns the world because they represent what we are. They represent the power and the corruption and that the world systems who should be taking care of things, they got it wrong. And Jesus flipped it completely on its head. Completely on its head. That it's it's not about the systems. It's not about what's happening here. It's about a demonstration that he has come and he has relinquished this and that the bankruptcy of our world is not enough. And that ultimately, by the world condemning him and putting him to death, what's the worst thing in the world that can happen to any of us? What is the one thing that anyone could say, you are going to be put to death? And Jesus came and he overcame it. And he showed in that, that I have overcome the world. I have overcome this brokenness. I have overcome this injustice. I have overcome that which is wrong. And now you can live in freedom because there is no more death. When death has lost its sting, what do we have to be fearful of as followers of Christ? So God came for three things. To demonstrate, why did he have to go to the cross? Why must he suffer? Why must he die? Why must he rise again in three days? Because he needed to demonstrate unconditional love. He needed to demonstrate true forgiveness. He needed to demonstrate the ultimate power over death. Hmm. But Jesus doesn't just stop there. Because it's not just about Jesus. Read on with me in verse 34 through 37. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus just laid out the ultimate it's not about you speech. He just laid it down and said, this is not 
about you. Why was Peter so furious when he heard Jesus speaking in this way? Because Peter had built his identity on this Messiah from strength to strength. That Jesus had come, he was going to conquer, he was going to show everybody, he was going to reign on top of the world, and Jesus just shattered everything. And Peter wanted Jesus to be a means to his ends, because Peter wanted to be the one right next to Jesus. And Jesus said, it ain't about that. It ain't about you sitting next to me. It ain't about you coming and having power. In fact, you're going to have to lose power, and you're going to have to follow me to the cross, and you're going to have to carry the cross with you. When Jesus says this, it's revolutionary to the, to the disciples, and it just, it just shattered everything that they had built up. And that's where Jesus continues to point to the cross. Now for me, hit the next slide. For me, this has been a constant struggle in my life. I can say this beyond a shadow of a doubt. This has been the one thing that I have struggled with more than ever. Because what I want is I want a Jesus who is in my car. I don't want Jesus out of the car, but I want Jesus in my car. But I still want to be the driver of my life. I want the nice Jesus sitting behind my shoulder, maybe giving me a left, maybe giving me a right, but ultimately I'm in control because it's mine and I'm going to take it and I'm going to have it. But that's not what Jesus requires. Hit the next one. Jesus wants and has to be the driver of your car. You are the one that has to submit and surrender all of you to him and let him drive wherever he's asking to go. This came with such clarity to me back in 2000 when I was in Haiti that it, it transformed my life. And that's what people, when they start to understand this, it transforms lives because Jesus, remember, he loves unconditionally. He died so you will be forgiven forever. He has paid the debt and he has overcome the grave. So there is no longer fear, there's freedom. Why wouldn't we build our life upon that? And that's what Jesus says, give it to me. If you give it to me, I will do more than you ever imagine. But you got to give it up. You got to give up yourself. You got to bring your joy, your pain, your pride. You got to bring your hurts. You got to bring all of you. I want all of you. I don't want just the good things. I want all of you. And when you do that, God will transform your life like no other. And that's the promise he makes over and over and over again. Now we have a saying in our organization that if I hear something, I may forget. And if I see something, I tend to remember, but when I do something, I understand. And so now you've just heard about what it is that God's requiring now I'm going to show you a few things that demonstrate this through, and I have to show it through my organization because that's, that's what I live. This is what I breathe. This is what I do. And so I'm going to show you a few things. And the first one is um, back in about 18 months ago, uh, we had a film crew that came down to Haiti with us, and they were doing a documentary on how Americans can help Haiti. And after the earthquake, there was something that happened. and all this, but Through all this, they realized there was something bigger going on here. There was something way bigger than they had imagined. And they said, we really want to focus on this transformation that's happened, this change that's happening. And so they've been walking with us for 18 months, and there's a summer coming out this fall. So I'm going to show the trailer of this video, and then we'll talk about it afterwards for a little bit. So in that clip, the one thing that really stood out to me, I didn't even talk about this with them, is that they start off with this whole self-reliance thing. And the funny thing about self-reliance is there's actually a bell curve in self-reliance. So Haiti's obviously on one side of the, of the bell curve where there's all this self-reliance where they don't have the things that we all have here. I mean, talked about heat. I mean, we'd be doing church in 100 degree weather if we're in Haiti right now. Um, but they're on this side of it. But we are on the other side of the bell curve where we are so self-reliant because we have everything 
And what do we teach and what is it that God has asked us? When we talk about change up there, what is it that God has asked us to change? It's four things. That people can understand that they are made by God, they are made after God, they are made in his image. That God is love, that God loves unconditionally, that God forgives unconditionally, and that there has been freedom in Christ because he's overcome the grave. And that there is servant leadership that needs to happen in people and that they need to lead like Jesus did, and then we give them the tools to go out and do it in their communities. That's what we're doing, and that's the gospel. That's what we're trying to be about. And so I'm pretty jacked about that, if you can't tell. Um, I'm pretty excited for that to come out. Secondly, what I want to do is I want to introduce Heidi to you. Um, Heidi Schulte is from our church. Heidi has been serving for the last year in Haiti, and she is a child of the king. And she serves... um, she serves with a servant heart. And so I'm so excited for her to share this, again, about transforming together. As you surrender yourself, what God can do. Yeah, watch out. I'm, I've been shaking this whole time, actually for a couple hours now, because I'm so excited. Um, yeah, that is all true. We're living it every day. It's not easy. In fact, it's harder than I think I ever thought um, going into this. But I want to share two stories, my friend Pauline's story and then my own. Um, And I want to share the reality of following God and saying yes. Um, And it's a reality that is crazy and unimaginable and awesome. And I can't even use, you know, those words we use all the time. But I can't even, there aren't words in the English language to describe how awesome and good it is. Um, But it's also hard and heartbreaking. And so um, I just want to share a little bit of that. So I met Pauline in October. Um, I work with an early childhood development program. That's kind of the core of what we do. And uh, we're really building from the bottom up with these families. So we have them five days a week, zero to three-year-olds with their parents. And we're trying to build families and um, children's lives in a way that grows them up to be like Jesus and to know him from the very beginning. Um, And so it's it's at the base of our ministry, um, and it really opened doors into the community. So through that program, we had a couple moms one day who were just staying behind talking, um, and they started sharing about this woman who was so sick, their friend. And I'd known them for two months at this point, and it was the first time they'd ever said anything. But they're like, yeah, we have this friend, and she's pregnant, and she can't move her body. And my creel at that point was was not very good. So I was like, what are they talking about? This sounds terrible. Um, They're like, she doesn't have a baby, but she's really sick. You need to come see her, Heidi. And I thought she was a mom in our program that I hadn't met. So I was like, yeah, we got to go. So my coworker and I jumped on his motorcycle, went to this house, and I walked in to um, a woman on a grass mat on her dirt floor, seven months pregnant, um, skin and bones, coughing. Um, She was paralyzed with everything, her legs, her arms, um, her mouth kind of drooped a little bit, so when she talked, it was hard to understand her. And she was turned away from us, so when I walked in the door, she heard us, and she tried to turn over and look at us, and as soon as she saw me, she started just going, ah, like, help me, I'm, I'm sick, I'm paralyzed, and she starts crying, and it's this despair that I've never seen before. Um, just complete, utter, oh my goodness, there's a chance I could be helped. There's a chance that someone might care right now. And I just started weeping, and I, I listened to her, um, asked questions, and came back, and I was, I was bawling my eyes out, and I came back, and I'm like, Tim and the team, we are helping this lady. I don't care what we have to do. We are getting her to the hospital. I mean, God just, it was one of those moments where you can't do anything else. You have to move. You have to answer. You have to say yes. So we got her to the hospital. Um, and uh, we got her in the wheelchair, and everybody's kind of staring at us, partly because it's me, and I stick out a little bit in Haiti, Um, but also because they're doing a sonogram on this baby, and she's alive and well, and the doctors are kind of looking at me like, how'd you find her? How how is this baby alive? What's going on? And and I think they also saw in Pauline um, a peace and a strength As we're going through the hospital, I'm panicking a little bit because I don't like needles. I don't like blood. I didn't want her to get hurt. I was so worried about her. I had my protective mama heart on. And so she's getting her blood drawn. And I'm like, okay, I can't look, but I'll hold your hand. And she goes, Heidi, I'm not afraid. And I'm like, you're crazy. 
She goes, no, I'm not afraid. So she's comforting me as we're in a hospital. Um, and she's, you know, completely paralyzed. It was, it was unbelievable. So this woman loves God and trusts him. You can go ahead and flip through some of the next pictures. Um, she has a faith. I mean, a lot of you know my mom and my sister Faith and their story of how God saved them from cancer. And um, she reminds me so much of my mother. And it was like a second round of walking with a woman through the valley of the shadow of death and watching God rescue a little baby girl all over again. Um, And all through it, even when she's in immense pain, we're pretty sure she continued having strokes um, through the last several months. And her body started shutting down. Um, We thought for a while she was getting better, she was getting stronger. And then the last few months, her body started shutting down. But every time I would go see her, even on her worst days, she would, she would cry. She would tell me about the pain. She would say, I'm suffering. Some days she was super discouraged, and I was a little bit worried about depression. Um, but every time she would raise her arm and her crippled hand and go, but God is good, and he is my father, and I will worship him. And she would just praise him and say, thank you, God, for saving my baby. Thank you for saving my life. Um, And to the end, even when she went completely blind, completely deaf in a matter of months, um, actually a matter of weeks, and she barely knew it was me with her, she was still praising God to her last day. Um, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to to how to even trust God on good days and praise him on days when things are going well. And she was praising him in extreme pain, extreme um, confusion. She didn't know at the end which family member was helping her. She didn't know night from day. Um, but she held on in the midst of suffering. And my last conversation with her, which was really her talking and me just trying to let her know that I was there, she said, you know, I want God to take me home. But until he does, I trust him, and I thank him, and he's good. Um, and so that what Tim was sharing about loving God and following him to the cross, she knows what that's like. And I have, I could talk about stories of these friends and these coworkers in Haiti who they know what it's like to suffer. We do not, <laughs> most of us. We do not know what it's like to be hungry. We do not know what it's like to have death threats on you and your family because you're doing the right thing, because you're being honorable, because you're being honest, because you're succeeding at something. People will put death threats on you. They'll try to put curses on you. They'll break into your house. Um, they'll, I know a good friend who, one of his best friends, turned his back on him and is now bad-mouthing him all over the area simply because he's doing the right thing. And he's um, actually, because he's working with us, one of his best friends. We, we don't really know what that's like to the, the same extent, I think. Um, and these people are the most patient, persevering, strong people that I've met in that way. They know what it's like to carry the cross. Um, and they're few and far between. It's really hard to follow Jesus in Haiti, just like it's really hard to follow him here. Um, so now I want to share the flip side, because this, this picture here of saying goodbye to her, um, she died on Haitian Mother's Day a few weeks ago, about two weeks ago today, I think. Um, And I knew it, but I was here, and it was hard. It was really hard. I FaceTimed with her family and looked at her body and was like, this isn't fair. She shouldn't have had to live like that. Um, But the beauty of it is Jesus overcame death. Her life wasn't lost. She, She wasn't a lost cause. That wasn't a defeat story. That was a, we're gonna see each other soon, and the, the testimony of her life is now impacting not just people in Sylvan, Haiti, but people in Pella, Iowa, and people who read our blogs and are listening to the story all over the, all over the country now. Um, her story is not done. It's just getting started. And um, so connecting back to my story, I went, to Tim, went with Tim to Haiti um, about almost exactly two years ago, and I didn't want to go. Um, if I'm really honest. Everybody in Pella goes to Haiti, is what I thought, and so I thought, I probably have a different story or a different calling. Um, 
and God knew what he was doing. He had me spontaneously sign up for the trip. And the whole way there, I was like, why am I going? I don't really want to. I don't have a heart for this. And that feels wrong. And so I finally surrendered a little bit and said, okay, God, if you really want me to go, you have to break my heart. You have to, to give me a love for these people because I don't really have one right now. Um, and we didn't even get to Pion, and I was already crying on the, in the van on the way there because God was breaking my heart. I mean, he'll take a little tiny begrudging yes <laughs> if you give it to him. Any inch, any, anything you surrender, he will take and run with it because he has such better plans for us than we do for ourselves. And so all week long, I mean, I was, I started to give in a little bit more as time went on because it was too good, but I kept breaking. I kept hurting. I saw things and met people that I never would have expected. And on day maybe three or four, I was in the bathroom, which happens to be a place that God speaks to me a lot. It's kind of humbling. Um, and he asked me to give up um, a really important relationship in my life because he wanted to call me to be a missionary. And so I, crying, you know, with lots of tears and lots of, okay, God, I don't want to do this, but I want to trust you, I gave that up. And the next day, I'm in the bathroom again. So see, there's a theme here. And um, he said, Heidi, would you be willing to die for me here? And I was like, what? What kind of question is that? What are you going to do? What's, what's, what's coming next, Lord? Really, can you tell me? And then maybe I'll say yes. And he was like, no, would you be willing to die for me in this place today if I ask you to? And we were just getting ready to finish out a, a leadership conference. And again, weeping this time, shaking, um, I told him yes. And I think it was maybe the next day we had just visited the hospital. And again, he'd broken my heart over the people there. Um, we were driving back in the pickup, and I was looking out at the palm trees and just like, wow, I love this place. I did not think I would love this place in the way that I do. But I love it. I love these people. I love this place. And he said, Heidi, would you come back with me here? Would you live with me here again? Um, and I, I didn't really quite believe it fully because he never gives me things in advance. But do you see the progression? He asks for a little bit. And if you say yes, he'll bless you. And then he'll ask for a little bit more. And if you say yes, he'll bless you. And then he'll ask for a little bit more. And finally, he's going to ask for your life. He's going to ask for every single thing. Even after that, I, sometimes it's just, Heidi, will you just give me five minutes? Heidi, will you just give me this worry that you're carrying right now? Like little things. It's not always big emotional moments. Sometimes it's just a little thing. Will you give me your meal? <laughs> because I want to talk to you. Will you let me break your heart to the point that you think you're never going to stop crying? And let me introduce you to this woman that I love and that I want you to walk with for a while. Will you let me, maybe it's talk to your family and share Jesus' love with them. Maybe it's stand out at work because you're different because you follow Jesus. I don't know what it is for you, but he's going to ask for it all. And if you say yes, just like Peter, just like Andrew, just like James and John and everybody else, if you say yes, <laughs> watch out because he'll use you to change the world. And that world might be your family, that world might be Pella, that world might be Iowa or somewhere else in the U.S., that world might be an entire country. Um, you never know, but please say yes. That's the invitation. Will you say yes to me? And if you do, like I said, watch out, because he'll just keep, just keep asking, and he'll keep doing more and more and more, um, and it'll be way worth it. And I'm just on the beginning of that. So hopefully that's encouraging. <laughs> Worship team, go ahead and come on up. So as we close today, again, if you hear it, you may forget. If you see it, which I hope you've seen it today, that you start to remember, the next step is, if I do it, I understand. So what is God, the king of the cross, the king that has given it all, what is he asking you today? And here's the cool thing about Jesus. I don't have to tell you what that is because you already know. For some of you, that heart is beating so fast right now because you know God's talking to you. Don't just walk by that. And I have, I have two very specific requests. And this is a BHAG, and Key said, you need to ask that this service because I think God has equipped somebody. 
Number one is we are taking a trip October 13th through October 20 to Haiti. And we are going to be teaching our leadership conference. And that's what you saw that whole change thing about. We teach about those four things that I talked about. And I am looking for people to go on this journey with me to go and teach about Jesus. And the thing about it is, is you're already equipped. I can tell you that right now. You are already equipped. So don't think, well, I'm not equipped, so I don't know if I should go. And if you are feeling that, please come talk to me. Number two, and this is the big one, we need more Heidi's. I need more Heidi's down in Haiti. God has exploded our ministry. We are ministering to about 25,000 people across the whole north central plateau of Haiti. And we have a couple, and we have two other Heidi's. We have four people, Americans. We have about 20 Haitian staff. But God is telling me we need more people to go. We need a couple. We need individuals. So if God is talking to you today, if he is at all tugging on your heart, if he is at all saying, you know what, Maybe I should consider that. Please have a conversation with me, and we can talk about it. It doesn't mean it's a yes, but it's a mean, you know what, God, I'm at least surrendering myself to say maybe. And if God says yep, then you'll open that door. Thank you. With that, Dale, go ahead.